Kia ora and welcome to 30 with me, Guy and Espiner. 30 minutes, one guest, no cuts. What we record is what you get. Michael Oppenheimer was one of the first scientists to warn us climate change was coming, and he's not happy to have been proven right. He's a long-time participant in the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007, alongside Al Gore. Michael Oppenheimer has shown how melting ice in the Antarctic threatens cities around the globe and once tutored Margaret Thatcher on global warming. Despite all his knowledge about the challenges we are facing, he still describes himself as an optimist. He's urging us to adapt to the changing climate, which he says is not fatalism, but realism. Let's start the clock, 30 minutes, with Michael Oppenheimer. <laughs> Michael Oppenheimer, welcome to 30. It's great to have you with us. Good to be here. We're recording this about a week out from the US presidential election. Has climate change been on the ballot? I mean, is, is it something that Trump and Harris are addressing, the warming planet? Well, uh, sort of indirectly it has. Unfortunately, there hasn't been enough discussion of what to do about climate change. Neither much discussion of uh, how, how much we need to cut emissions as quickly as possible and get off fossil fuels to just halt, eventually halt the warming, and not enough discussion about what we do in the meantime to protect ourselves, to adapt to climate change. Indirectly, it's been on there because we had a couple of really powerful hurricanes, and uh, the media were forced to talk about, to some extent, the relationship with climate change. Um, the candidates don't seem to have wanted to address it. And that's kind of traditional in the U.S. The, the issue, no matter how important it may seem to a lot of people, uh, and most Americans are concerned about it, uh, has always been downpedaled because the candidates generally are risk averse. Uh, however, these the two of them, uh, Harris and Trump, are quite distinct in their approaches to the problem and the level of concern and belief that they've expressed. So it certainly will make a difference who wins the U.S. election. In what respect? I mean, do you see Trump sort of having some tendencies towards climate change denial? Is that what you're saying there? Well, it's more than tendencies. He has outright denied the problem uh, several times. Uh, lately, he's kind of muted the denial part, uh, but he doesn't have a good a counter story or description of what he does believe about the problem to lead anybody to think that he'll actually do anything about it. His basic philosophy is let's drill oil and coal, and dig for coal and natural gas any place we can. And he's uh, got a deregulatory attitude. Let's not create any more government uh, regulation that could get in the way of people who want to produce more and more fossil fuels. So that's problematic. On the other hand, the Biden administration, with which Harris has been part of, has been quite aggressive and for the first time uh, stimulated the passage of U.S. legislation, which it will over time have a profound effect on U.S. emissions. Uh, it, the trouble is that it's not quite enough to get the U.S. in a position of being able to say, we've done everything we can, or we've set it in place, and look to the rest of the world to make sure that they do the same or to ask that they do the same. But the U.S. has now gone quite far with what's called the Inflation Reduction Act, which allocates a tremendous amount of money to, to consumers who would buy, say, solar energy products, uh, solar cells, or, uh, or wind turbines, to producers of these the manufacturers, and to, the, say, the power companies to uh, who would have to adapt, adopt these new technologies to displace the fossil fuels they currently burn and that are the source of the problem. In addition, the U.S. transportation system is electrifying with the objective of fueling that system with solar energy, wind, geothermal, all the renewable energy, which can displace fossil fuels. So that's great and it's underway. Uh, the trouble is, A, it's hard to get. There are other countries which have to get in gear, too. Some are, some are not. Um, and 
at the same time, this is only the first, it's a big first step, but it's only the first serious step that the U.S. will have taken to actually reduce its emissions. U.S. emissions are coming down, in fact. We'll return to politics and lobbying and vested interests throughout the interview, I'm sure, because there's a lot of that at stake in, in this subject. Uh, but let's go to the state of play on the climate. Are you saying that we need to prepare for a brand new climate? Yes, definitely. And the reason is, A, the climate has already changed. We're here. We're in a brand new climate. Uh, uh, rainstorms are much more intense than they used to be, the extreme storms. We're going to get more of that. Uh, sea level is rising, will continue to rise, and is starting to flood coastal areas, even at high tide, uh, which happened previously, but only on a very limited basis. Now it's becoming pervasive. Uh, it, during a big storm, say one of the hurricanes that struck recently in the U.S., there is, um, you know, that on top of rising seas gives you a storm surge and then a high tide and then a rising sea level. So you get inland flooding in places we never had. And this isn't just true in the U.S. These kinds of things are happening any place that there are hurricanes, any place that there are coastal storms. And most important, almost everywhere on Earth is hotter than it used to be even New Zealand say, and because it's hotter than it used to be, most of those places are seeing more extremely hot days and extreme heat kills. So we're in a climate where people are dying because it's hotter and extremely hot on certain occasions. We're in a climate where we're getting extreme flooding conditions, either near the coast or inland due to heavy rain, on the coast due to storms primarily, and people aren't ready for it. And people are dying in greater numbers, I we think, in floods. We're in a situation where natural ecosystems are suffering. Because unlike some human beings, at least, they can't get up and move. Trees don't have legs. So we're seeing a situation where species are under threat and certain ecosystems are changing, shrinking, being displaced by others. So we're in a situation where the climate has changed and there is already a big effect on human beings. So it doesn't pay to stick our head in the sand and pretend this is some problem for the distant future. It's a problem for now. And because we haven't turned the emissions uh, situation around yet, we're gonna get more climate change until the climate stabilizes. And even then, there's a lot of lags in the climate system, like with sea level rise. Sea level rise won't turn around immediately, even if we stabilize the climate. It's gonna take decades or longer, Some in some situations, centuries. So we have to plan for a different future, but we also have to start protecting ourselves today because we're in a situation and we're in a world where some people are capable, for instance, of buying air conditioning in hot countries and others are not. And the people that can't, you're probably going to see more of them being uh, dying over time. Let's just spend a minute or two on the basic science of climate change and the greenhouse gas effect, just so all our listeners and viewers are on the same page. So the natural greenhouse gas effect is good, right? Sun comes down heats the earth, some of that heat bounces back towards space, and then the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, they trap some of that heat and keep the planet warm enough to sustain life. So, so far, so good. But what happens if we burn f fossil fuels at the rate that we are doing? What happens then? So what you described as a greenhouse effect, which is a good thing, it's a natural thing, Unfortunately, what we have is a greenhouse problem because we've been pumping up levels of the critically important greenhouse gases for the last couple of hundred years, ever since the Industrial Revolution. And what we need to do is stop the exponential growth in fossil fuel use, which is the main source of carbon dioxide, along with deforestation. Uh, and there are other greenhouse gases that also are associated with uh, fossil fuel combustion, like methane, which is released when you open a coal seam or when you use natural gas. And we have to back all that down because otherwise the climate will just keep changing. The way to think about it is that once greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, are in the atmosphere, they don't wash out of the atmosphere automatically like normal pollutants. They stay there for years 
decades, centuries, and in the case of carbon dioxide, millennia. So it's not like they they stay at the, the high level they're at now, but just if we stopped all emissions today, blew up every power plant, ran every automobile into the ocean, the, it would, the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would come down. Initially, uh, over a few decades, it would be cut in, you know, Two uh, in about a third, and then maybe a half. But then it, there's a, what's called a long tail. The amount in the atmosphere stretches out for a millennium or more. And there's enough already added, enough of an excess. So that means we'll be trapping heat and be at a an abnormal climate for that long, for up to a millennium. What do we do about it? We should stop using fossil fuels as soon as, as feasible, recognizing there are some economic implications and figuring out how to deal with that. And by the way, as a footnote, the new energy sources have now been become cheap so that in my country, which used to be coal de dependent, it's cheaper to use solar energy and it's cheaper to use wind energy. And that's what most of the world's new energy sources are are from. They're not from coal, oil, and natural gas. They're from solar and wind. And it, that trend needs to be accelerated. So we have a solution to the problem. We know what to do. We're just not implementing it fast enough because of the difficulty of opposition from the fossil fuel industry, among other problems. So on the trajectory where we are, people will have heard about this 1.5 degrees warming as opposed to uh, pre-industrial levels. Are we going to be able to stay under that? No. In fact, there's some cal by some calculations, we're already over it. So we're in a what some people have characterized as a climate da danger zone. It doesn't mean the earth is about to end. It doesn't mean humanity is about to disappear. It does mean that the risks start to pile on top of each other. We're gonna be get simultaneously too much heat in some areas, torrential rains, it rains in other areas, too much drying because the heat bakes the, uh, the moisture out of soils, makes it hard to get drinking water because there's less running off into rivers. It makes it hard on farmers to grow crops. Sea level is rising faster and faster. So we're going to get a concatenation of impacts on human beings and on societies. For a while, people, rich people in rich nations like New Zealand and the United States will be able to deal with it. But over time, it'll be more and more pressure on the economies if we don't do anything to, to halt the problem. P people in poor countries or even poor people in rich countries don't have the resources. A lot of people in, in warm countries don't have air conditioning yet. And certainly in countries that are just developing, air conditioning is not widespread. And a lot of those countries are in the tropics where it's already very hot. So you add a few degrees on top of that, you really have a public health threat. So we need to back off this terrible situation we've created. We need to introduce these new energy sources as quickly as possible. And we need to protect ourselves in the meantime and protect those who can't afford to protect themselves. You have talked about the fact that we have a fairly good chance of stopping the warming a little north of two degrees, I think I heard you say at a New York Times event uh, podcast that was running. What would that world look like? I presume you're looking sort of towards the end of the century there, but what would a two degree uh, global temperature rising world look like? It would still be very tough in countries in the tropics, which are already very hot because any additional warming is too much for them. Even um, in, in, in my country or in your country, uh, which has a, both have a more moderate climate, particularly New Zealand, by the way, uh, you, it would be hard to deal with, but we could probably manage. Again, if, if, the, if the people who have the resources are willing to you know, share the responsibility of having used a lot of emissions, it makes it easier to help people who don't have the resources to survive. And what will happen if, if we, at two degrees, we'll lose some ecosystems, which particularly at risk at two degrees are coral reefs. Uh, in your part of the world, there are some spectacular coral reefs 
the, the, the what's called the rainforest of the ocean because of their biodiversity, they're in big trouble. And any between one and two degrees is where they start to shrivel away. And you get above two degrees, I'm afraid, it's not like 100% of them will be gone, but they will have diminished from a globally uh, widespread in the tropics, beautiful place. Uh, I don't know if you've ever gone diving or snorkeling. I've done it a lot. Uh, they're gonna, they're just gonna be less present, and the more we get above two degrees, the let there'll be fewer and fewer reefs of the kind we're used to knowing. And that what that experience with the reefs is just the beginning of the stress on all kinds of ecosystems who aren't used to the warm weather. So that's number one. Number two is inevit it is inevitable that extreme heat will increase as we get towards two degrees. When when it's too hot and the temperature doesn't fall enough at night, so p the p body can recover for people who don't have air conditioning, you get a situation which is extremely threatening to their health, uh, and especially when it's combined with air pollution, which it frequently is, and that combination is bad for the cardiovascular system, and if you add extreme humidity, uh, a higher humidity on top of that, which we're going to get in most places, you, you that combination can be deadly. And you, you, we, we have seen heat waves recently, which have killed an astounding number of people. For instance, Europe had one in uh, 2003, which killed about 40,000 people. Some pe Some estimates are higher. And we had thought Europe had learned a lesson but there was another big heat wave in Europe in 2022, which killed over 60,000 people. So they hadn't adjusted. Why? Well, probably it has to do with less air conditioning in a place like Europe. You look at a place like New Zealand, and I don't know how widespread air conditioning is, but I'd suspect due to the moderate climate, it's not all that common. And you have to worry about something like that. People are not prepared. And so- Yeah, could, could, I, could I just- um, and, and yeah, could I just interrupt you there quickly um, to talk about wet bulb moments, because this is something that is really quite a harrowing thing. I mean, as I understand it, I mean, you've got this heat and humidity combination. We we call ourselves by, by sweating, don't we? But that only works when the sweat can, can evaporate. So you get to sort of a 35 degree wet bulb moment and you run into real problems. Can you talk talk to that and what sort of danger that that poses? Well, it is a, there's a theoretical limit to uh, how fast the body has to be able to dissipate the heat that it creates. And, you know, we do it by sweating. And if there's too much humidity in the air and you're trying to sweat a lot because it's all so hot, the water from your body won't evaporate. It, you know, your body uh, can give off water and it can evaporate much more effectively in a dry climate than a damp climate. And so what happens is the heat is on the body is unable to dissipate heat. And as a result, and the best measure of that is a wet bulb temperature. And as a result, it is thought that there's kind of a limit of how hot it can get. And it de varies depending on the humidity. And if, if you're outside, and you're above the wet bulb temperature, and you're doing strenuous exercise, you're taking your life in your hands, literally. Uh, and so we can imagine a world in the future where children won't be able to play soccer outside, for instance, where construction workers will be taking their life in their hands, and all construction, may, outdoor construction may have to be done at night, where agricultural workers won't be able to work the fields because they it will be, really will be a mortal risk. So does a wet bulb temperature accurately measure that? There's now a discussion in the medical community if maybe there aren't better ways to do it. But at the current time, it doesn't look good because we're going into a world which is going to be hotter and more humid in general. And the reason it's going to be more humid, even in hot places or especially in hot places, is because there's more moisture evaporating from particularly the oceans. And, it, it, and because the ocean temperature is hotter, that humidity in some places will be converted into rainfall. And you, that's why you get more intense rainstorms in a hotter climate. But in other areas, the drying of the soils from the extra heat will defeat the extra rainfall. And you'll get a situation where there won't be enough water around at the surface for drinking water or for agriculture. So we're, getting, we're messing with the very fundamental aspects of the climate, which make Earth a nice place to live.
And okay. instead, we're trading it for a much more risky place. And you first started to realize this near the end of the 60s. I read that in 1969, it wasn't quite the summer of love, was it? It was possibly the, the, the summer of Woodstock. You're a young doctoral uh, student at that time, um, and you're, you're reading about how um, we can do this immense damage to, to, the, to the earth um, if we burn fossil fuels in this way. Uh, you, you were nearly um, working in astrophysics, weren't you? Or at least going in that direction. You had something of a metamorphosis. Explain that journey and, and why you took it. Well, I, I, I had been an undergraduate at MIT at the time I was at the University of Chicago. I was reading the MIT alumni magazine, and I just happened to stumble on an article which was basically something like the 10 ways that human beings are changing the climate. And one of the, the things that really struck me was the greenhouse gases, the emissions of carbon dioxide from burning coal, oil, and natural gas. And I was shocked because, and I'm not a person that's easily shocked or scared, but this time it got me. And because I was thinking, how could human beings be changing the climate? And this is something that some people still don't understand. But I, you know, I was a scientist. I carefully went through the physics of the problem and I came to understand that this was real. It hadn't been noted. It wasn't noticeable yet, but it was going to probably become noticeable over the next few decades. And that something damn well should be done about it. But I didn't know how to channel that into some useful contribution to getting something done about it. But over the next decade or so, my professional uh, route took me uh, to a place where I understood uh, what needed to be done, what I could contribute as a scientist, let's put it that way. And so I, I took my degree, and instead of working on astrophysics, where I had been working for 10 years, I started working with one of what are called the green groups, the environmental groups, the Environmental Defense Fund. And that put me into the decision, into the political arena where I saw how decisions are made by political leaders. I got a good understanding of why things you could have an obvious problem like climate change and not enough or nothing in some cases would be done about it. And I basically spent the rest of my life trying to A, get something done about it and B, now teaching the next generation what they need to do to solve the problem. Okay. Uh, I'm interested in your views quickly then on activism and climate activism and what works and what doesn't. We've seen recently soup thrown over famous artworks, a surge in climate change lawsuits. What are your thoughts about what works and what doesn't? Well, I think that uh, thro throwing uh, uh, materials which could be harmful at artworks uh, probably does more to alienate people than engage them. So I don't think it's it's not a good idea, and I wouldn't do it myself. On the other hand, I think that uh, passive resistance uh, tactics like demonstrations, uh, challenging politicians or corporate leaders in public uh, who are not doing enough about the problem or not doing anything or actually pushing it in the other direction. I think those, those are all reasonable things. Nonviolent things which get the public's attention are the way, sometimes the way change happens. So I, I fully support actions that help educate the public rather than help alienate the public. Okay, let's spend a little bit of time on, on sea level rise because you've specialised in this and you've, you've brought it up a, f a few times. If we look at the ice sheets, um, Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets, uh, are they getting close to tipping points in terms of real damage and collapse? Uh, let's back up a little bit. There are three reasons the sea level rises in a warm, warmer world. One, w seawater is a fluid. When you heat fluids, they usually expand. So just the ocean water we already have is expanding. And where does it go? It laps onto the land. It gets higher and laps onto the land. So you lose land in that process. Number two, mountains like the ones you have in New, in New Zealand have glaciers. Glaciers melt when they get warmer in general. And globally, most of the glaciers we have in the mountains are melting. And third are the two great ice sheets that are remaining in Greenland and Antarctica. 
And we know now that they are and have been for about the last 30 years losing mass into the ocean. That water goes in the ocean, raises sea level. And so what we've got is a situation where we're worried that this process could accelerate. In fact, it is accelerating. As the Earth warms, it's going fast. The sea level contribution from the two ice sheets is getting faster and faster. And there is a concern that for some parts of those two ice sheets, there's a point of no return, where if we keep pushing them by heating them up so much, not only will we not be able to you know, rebuild the ice, you know, by sucking the water out of the ocean naturally, you know, there's rain turned to snow falling on ice sheets, but, uh, you know, it'll happen. Yeah, sorry, we just lost you uh, for a, a technical glitch there momentarily. So my apologies for that. We were talking about the the ice sheets um, and some of these would be, I mean, utterly catastrophic if they were to melt, right? I mean, the West Antarctic ice sheet would raise sea levels by more than 10 feet if, if it were to go totally. Is that still something that is well, well in the future or, or possibly not at all? Or is that something that is now blipping away on the radar? Uh, so a, a sea level rise of about uh, 10 feet uh, could happen, maybe a little more due to loss of much or all of the West Antarctic ice sheet. But it's not like there's this giant tidal wave going to come rolling in on you. It, it, we would, in the worst case, we would uh, trip over a threshold which would cause it then gradually over the course of uh, a few hundred years at minimum to wind up, all that water wind up in the ocean, that all that ice would go in the ocean, it would melt and it would raise sea level. So it's not something that's instantaneous, but it would create a rate of sea level rise over the time period just after you go over that threshold, which would be much faster than anything that we are experiencing or have experienced in the last few decades, and would be very hard for us to adjust to. It would be too quick for us to just move away from the coast. It would be too quick to re replicate all the infrastructure that we can't move. Basically, there would be a lot of damage done. Coastal civilization as we know it would disappear. The Thwaites but, Glacier. So you asked me. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. You might ask, so what's the likelihood that that'll happen? We don't know. We know that parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet, one part in particular, is very vulnerable. And if that goes, a lot of the ice behind it will wind up in the ocean. But we don't know exactly where that threshold is. What we can say is it's probably not too much over two degrees. And so... If we could control it and keep the warming as close to two degrees or below as we could, I think one of the things we'd be doing is doing the future a favor by not getting into the soup in terms of the rate of sea level rise. You've talked a lot about adaption, um, and yeah. you're not saying, well, this is sort of fatalism, but you're saying no matter what we do, we are going to have to adapt, right? So what are you, are you talking, you're talking about seawalls, you're talking about mass movement of people. Is that what you mean by, by adaption? Well, it, it, a smart adaptation plan has options. And you don't want to force people, to, you want to let them make their decisions, but you want to give them some reasonable options, and then you want to help them take advantage of it. So, for instance, there are seven or eight ways you could defend the coast, and some are practical in some areas. Like, I live in New York City. Uh, they're going to protect this place by building whatever infrastructure is necessary. But at the same time, there are some people who live in areas that are already flooding, they're probably going to have to get out of the way by retreating inland. But the, the big coastal areas of places like not just the U.S., but even New Zealand, you're not going to build a wall around the whole country. So people, some areas are not going to be able, we're not going to be able to protect them. People are going to move. In certain places, maybe countries are going to do what the Netherlands did, which is build out into the ocean. Uh, but that's expensive, and it has some environmentally nasty effects, and we can't do it every way either. So we're going to, but if you have a mixture of options and you have time to plan and you have time to give people choices, you have a much better chance of having a world later that people will find acceptable rather than have 
you know, people saying I had a flea, I became a climate refugee, I had a run from where I lived, and they're not going to be happy about that. And that kind of thing can create political turmoil. So the earlier we start planning for the world, the part of the of this climate change that's inevitable for the world, the better everybody will be, the better the economies of the country will be, the better the politics of the countries will be, the happier people will be. If we wait till the last minute, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be unhappy and some that won't make it at all. Just a final question, because we're nearly out of time. And for our audience again, you know, people looking for hope, looking for action, how would you answer this question? What's the best thing I can do right now? Uh, the best thing that that you can do is always the same. It's vote. You live in a democracy. Vote for political leaders that are going to really take this problem seriously. And there are a lot of political leaders now who are starting to get the right frame of mind about it. Beyond that, make sure in your own life that you have clean things up, so to speak. When you go in to buy a stove or an air conditioner or a home heating system, making sh make sure you're getting something which really doesn't have to use a lot of electricity or doesn't have to uh, emit gases which are going to hurt the planet. And particularly your automobile, that's a big source, if you have one, that's a big source of carbon dioxide emissions. Get the one that has the highest mileage or get an electric car and then charge it with renewable energy. And so look at every aspect of your life, but also you're in the media. Educating the public, it's always going to be a good thing to do. So there, already, you got three I, things I, I, you can do. I already feel better about um, my, my day. Thank you very much for joining us. I really enjoyed our discussion. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you very much for making time for us, Michael Oppenheimer. Thanks, man. Thanks. That was 30 Minutes with Michael Oppenheimer. This is 30 with me, Guy and Espiner, and we'll catch you next time.